Hello. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita Haney. I am the assistant director um, in the Office of Sorority and Fraternity Life at KU and I use the pronoun she, her, and hers. Uh, today I will be reading from Grown uh, by Tiffany D. Jackson. Um, very excited to get into this book um, and give you all just some personal thoughts on it um, and also read some of the chapters um, so that maybe you will want to go out and get it. Um, I read the book in 24 hours, so that's how good it is. Also, if you would like to be entered into a raffle, uh, make sure you uh, engage in the comments and then also like the post for this particular reading and your name will be entered into a raffle. Okay, so we're going to get into it. So, Tiffany D. Jackson, she is a young adult middle grade author. Uh, she is a black woman. Um, a lot of her books are centered around issues um, that black girls face. Um, one of her critically acclaimed books is Allegedly and Monday is Not Coming. And so she always centers um, the adultification of black girls is what I have come to learn about her work. And so Pretty much what that means is that um, adultification is a form of bias, right? And racial prejudice against black girls and the fact that they are not, they are considered more mature, even though they're children. And so that is something that kept coming up for me in this particular book. And so I actually, before I read a chapter, I'm going to... Uh, read her author's note and then I will read some of the chapters. So this is her author's note in the back of Grown. It says, my first boyfriend was 22 years old. I was 15. The greatest secret I ever kept. It was exciting and invigorating to be considered so beautiful and adult-like. Everything a teen girl dreams of being seen as. But ultimately, I knew it wasn't right. The sneaking around, the lying, still at that age, I should not have been the first to come to that conclusion. Although I did go to a predominantly white high school in Westchester and was in Jack and Jill, I want to be clear. This book is completely a work of fiction. If you've read Allegedly or Monday's Not Coming, you already know this book was inspired by a case, but this book is not about R. Kelly, nor is it an account of his allegations. This book is about the abuse of power it's about the pattern of excusing grown men for their behavior while faulting young girls for their missteps. It's about the blatant criticism of girls who are victims of manipulation. It's about holding the right person accountable for the crime he committed. It's about corporations attempt, attempting to silence victims and continuing to profit off the very monster they helped create. About the individuals who were meant to protect and serve never believing victims in their moments of bravery. It's about girls trying to defend themselves against the world and the possibility of similar situations happening to anyone. Even to girls from two parent household. This book is not about R. Kelly. It's about adults who know the difference between right or wrong because no matter where you stand on the issue, he knew better. It is possible to have a loving relationship full of mutual respect and good intentions like Gabriella's, but if you ever feel you are in a situation like Enchanted, where you're being used, threatening, threatened, sexually coerced, or you simply feel uncomfortable, please seek help right away. Tell your parents, one of your friend's parents, a trusted teacher or a relative. So Enchanted Jones, she is the main character of the book. Um, she has aspirations to, she loves to sing, but she also loves to swim and she has aspirations to, uh, be a singer. And so, um, at the beginning of the novel, I won't read that particular one cause it could be a little triggering. Uh, she wakes up in a pool of blood, um, and it is in present day, but then the book goes back into past so that you can kind of understand what's happening. So we're going to jump in into the portion of the book. Uh, where she pretty much is pursuing her dreams to be a singer. Um, and so this chap this is chapter five. It's called Bright Eyes. 
Backstage is dark enough to mask the on oncoming tears, the perfect place to hide when you need a moment or two or 10 or 15. I need a few before rejoining mom, before spending the 45 minute drive home in awkward silence. I tricked her into taking me to this audition all for nothing. I don't understand. I know I nailed that song, did way better than others, but maybe it wasn't the song choice. Maybe it was the whole package that turned them away. My skin, my clothes, my crooked smile, my non-existent hair. Nice song. His breath touches the back of my neck and I whip around. Corey feels. My tongue plays dead in my mouth, lips parting. When did he come back here and how? Wait. I'm talking to Corey Fields. Well, no, I'm not talking. He's talking to me. Say something, dummy. Um, thanks. His smile lights up the dark space. Up close, he smells rich like honey and musky tanning oil. His outfit is crisp, not a speck of dirt on him, not even on his kicks. Interesting pick, he says, nodding as if impressed. Interesting, I repeat. I'm just surprised someone your age would choose such a classic. I don't know how to take take that, so I shrug and offer honesty. It's one of my grandmother's favorites. He pauses, a stunned look in his eyes before chuckling. Yeah, mine too. We stand in silence staring at each other. The next contestant is already on stage singing Beyonce. Guess I missed the memo that I should have gone with any song from her catalog. Corey seems much taller in his music videos, towering over every girl he dances on, but in person, he's regular. Not that he's short or nothing, just not the LeBron James I thought he'd be. More Steph Curry. You have a voice, he says. You take lessons? Kinda. I don't think YouTube counts. But I practice all the time and write my own songs. Hmm. Well, you should take some professional ones. I blink. Ouch. Was I that bad? Oh, no. Not like that, he chuckles. But even naturals need some coaching, like sports. You get better the more you train. You feel me? I think of Coach Wilson and smile. Yeah, I think I know exactly what you mean. Corey searches my face. Here, let me show you something real quick. I gasp as he steps towards me, laying one hand flat on my stomach, then the other on the middle of my back. I tense up, frantically searching the room. Does anyone see this? Corey feels is touching me. But there's only bodyguards, and they all seem to be standing away from us, backs turned, pretending they're invisible. Relax, Ma. It's okay. You're safe with me, he says, a wink with a voice raspy. See, you got to breathe from your diaphragm. Do it with me. Ready? I breathe in, my deep, my belly <laughs> expanding as he caresses my back. Now release a note as you exhale. I do as he says, and the note comes out smooth and effortless. See? Better? Yeah, I giggle. Better. I look up into his eyes. And I can't look away. So I don't because he doesn't either. His lips pressed into a hard line part. Damn, you got some beautiful eyes. My heart beats hard against my ribs. Hands rested on his like they've always belonged there. Rubbing the rough patches on his knuckles. Then it hits me. I'm touching Corey Fields. The Corey Fields. And mom could come back here any moment. I'd be sixth grade all over again when I got caught in the closet kissing Jose Torres. Except Corey isn't a regular boy like Jose. He's so much more. I um I gotta go. My mom is probably wondering where I'm at. A flash of confusion sweeps across his face. He hesitates before unattaching himself. How old are you? I go. 17. For a long moment, his face is expressionless. Then he offers a smile. You're gonna come to my show next Saturday, Saturday he says. I'll hook you and your parents with some VIP tickets. The last contestant jogs backstage with a face-splitting smile. She was picked, of course. Um, okay, I say. Your name will be at the box office, he says, whipping out his phone before winking at me. See you later, bright eyes. He taps one of his bodyguards, who gives me a once-over before exiting. Butterflies tickle the inside of my chest. Maybe I'm hallucinating, because there's absolutely no way Corey Fields would ever be into me. Uh, this is chapter six. Um, it's a star is born. According to Wikipedia, Corey Fields is a twenty eight is twenty eight years old. Corey was a protege, a child superstar at thirteen. He was discovered on YouTube singing Stevie Wonder songs. Raised by his grandmother, he could play several instruments, including drums, piano, guitar, and even trumpet. 
all self-taught while spending hours at his local Baptist church. They called him the second coming of Michael Jackson, which with, with such hit singles as Invincible, I remember you, work it, and love is a verb. My parents loved dancing to his songs, A Lifetime of Love. 15 top Billboard hits, triple platinum albums, back-to-back -back sold out concerts and tours. He won his first Grammy at age 15. He's an E shy of being an EGOT, and that is Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. The shirtless photo on the cover of his latest album is like an oil painting of a Greek god. He's the color of the earth, dark eyes, sharp chin, perfect nose, a chest chisel out of amber stone, muscles forming a V right above his jeans waistband. Corey Fields is 28 years old. He's young, but not that young. Um, something I just want to say uh, as the author noted in her author's note is that this story is about an abuse of power. Um, and we know that so sometimes those in power, um, they use that to manipulate um, young girls, specifically black girls. And if you know anything um, surrounding the case with uh, R. Kelly, that is how he was able to coerce a lot of the uh, young girls that he abused um, to be in relationship with him. And so those two chapters, and again, this story is not about R. Kelly, um, but those two chapters show how the beginning of the relationship between Enchanted and Corey starts. Um, and so I'm just gonna read this chapter because as we know, there's a history of older men who are considered adults preying on young girls specifically young black women and you know it's viewed in society as acceptable but the reality is um there is by no stretch of the imagination it's never okay for a full-grown adult to be in a relationship with a child because you know when you are under the age of 18 you are still considered a child um, so this particular chapter this is chapter 23 uh it's called history in fourth period u.s history i'm busy doing math Corey is 28, I'm 17. That's only an 11 year difference. When I'm 18, he'll be 29. Gabri Gabriella is three years younger than Jay. Kylie was eight years younger than Tyga. Beyonce was 18 when she met 30 year old Jay-Z. Mom is seven years younger than daddy. It's not that uncommon. Mr. Thomas is talking about the civil war, but there's a different kind of war going on inside me the kind that will take an infinite number of battles to win. On one hand, I shouldn't want Corey as much as I do. On the other, I've never known anyone like him. We have so much in common. What if he's my soulmate, my destiny? Age ain't nothing but a number, Corey once told me, and he's right. People always say how mature I am for my age, even mom. Still, it won't look right, hard to explain how two souls swam across the universe and found each other. Maybe I should wait until I'm 18. But what if he finds someone else before then? Are you sure this is right? This doesn't, hello, Earth to Enchanted? Gab copies my biology homework with the carrot stick hanging out her mouth. Huh, what? Yo, what's with you lately? Nothing, I choke out a laugh. I haven't told Gab yet. She has a way of asking questions that hit so sharp it could cut me open. Then she'd know. Whatever. So I'm off this Saturday and, and Jay is out of town. Want to hang out and do something fun and irresponsible? Thought you said it's your dad's weekend. She rolls her eyes. Yeah, well, he's not speaking to me at the moment. Still, is it about Jay? She shrugs. So do you want to chill or what? I want to pry, but Gab is a wall when it comes to her dad. Um, I can't. I have something. A swim meet. Um, yeah, cool. Well, you're lost. Guess I'll just Netflix and chill. I swallow, building up the courage. I'm going to skip school tomorrow. Gab raises an eyebrow. Really? For what? There's an audition. In the city. Mom isn't going to take me, so I'm going to go. Alone. Cover for me? Gab leans back with a smirk, impressed. Well, look at you. This is a whole new enchanted. All right, I got you. Kill it. What I found very interesting about this particular chapter was that uh, the main character, Enchanted, you know, she goes through, she's in history class, but she's going over the history of how we have seen in society young girls be with older men. 
um, and it has become normalized. But uh, the better part of her understands that it's not normal and it's not necessarily something that she should be doing. Um, but because one, this particular, uh, I would say, authority figure has something that she wants. She wants to be a singer. Uh, she is very interested in pursuing this relationship with him. He obviously at this point is making her feel comfortable and uh, safe with him and all of those things. And as the story progresses, um, we get to learn a little bit more about their relationship and a little background about him, um, which is that he also has some uh, trauma things happening in the background. Um, and so again, as the story continues, I don't want to give too much away because I think you should definitely go out and pick this book up. But I also found it interesting that Enchanted talked about how um, everyone always tells her she's so mature for her age. And that is where the whole adultification of black girls comes in uh, because there was a study done about the erosure um, of black girls and uh, their innocence. And that is often how society views black girls in comparison to our white counterparts, that we need less protection, that we are more mature. Um, and so that is something that you see reflected throughout this story as it continues. Um, and so now I'm gonna get into the part of the story where things begin to kind of unravel uh, and Enchanted realizes that this is a, a relationship the dynamic that is harmful to her um and so yes this chapter is chapter 47 it's called jellyfish i was stung by a jellyfish once back in far rockaway while snorkeling close to the rock bank i noticed the plastic bag floating nearby or at least i thought it was a plastic bag people are always throwing their trash in the ocean but when i moved closer the bag came to life its tentacles darting and a three alarm fire broke out on my arm. I popped up to the surface with a scream. Daddy rushed in and carried me to the shore. Mom doused the fire with salt water. Lifeguards brought the first aid kit. Shooting stars covered the clear blue sky as the intense burning raged on. At grandma's, while she soaked my wound in vinegar wraps, I looked up facts about jellyfish. Jellyfish have no brains. Nah, I never said anything about recording an album. You imagine things. Oh, so what? You don't trust me now? Get in your room. Jellyfish have no hearts. What you mean? Of course I love you. Why you keep asking me that shit? Jellyfish have no eyes. You don't see that? That dirt right there? You better clean that shit up. I mean it. Clean all that shit up. Jellyfish are spineless. Swimming. What the fuck I look like swimming? Nah, ma. The pool is just for show. We're not going in there. Jellyfish don't purposefully sting humans only when provoked or touched. Why do you make me so mad? Why can't you do what I tell you? Do you want to go home? Is that what you want? I'll send you home, I swear. At night, I drink my purple drink, wondering if daddy will come and save me again. Okay. And then the next chapter is called Ready Player One. It's chapter 48. Corey is addicted to video games. Ha, 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 got him. Mainly he loves playing Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas. He likes for me to watch while he plays. So that's what I do. I sit next to him on the white sofa for hours, tapping a pen against my songbook, hoping he'll catch the hint that we should be working, not playing games. How many songs do you need on an EP, I ask. He shrugs, still focused on the screen, like four, maybe five. You shouldn't be worried about all that. Oh, hold up, hold up. It's been weeks and we've only recorded one. I'll take months, it'll take months at this rate. Just need three more. I breathe in the thought, flipping through the warp pages of my book. And once I have them, he won't be able to take them away from me. Yep, got that bitch. Guess he beat some level or something that the scene changes. A man with the fro in the dank, messy bedroom with the half-dressed girl. She gives him head, then they're on the bed having sex, all controlled by Corey, while Fro Guy narrates, I ain't never understood the phrase meaningless sex. Creighton used to play this game too. Now I see why. Don't understand why the girl is naked, why the guy is fully dressed. It's kind of weird. It's kind of gross, but Corey takes his time pressing the button, following instru instructions. Push up and down in rhythm. Joy 3, change view. 
Joy one changed position. Joy four quit. You know, first time I had sex, he says, without sparing a glance, I was 14. My eyes sh shoot over to him. This fine-ass woman, she taught me a few things. Ha, Richie was there. The girl on the video game moans. Like in the room with you. Nah, but he was around somewhere. Happened right after I signed to RCA at a Grammy's after party. Shorty took me to the coat closet or something. I ain't gonna front. I was shook. Never been with a woman before. The sex scene is awfully long. Come on, girl. I ain't insecure. Just tell me I'm great. That's really young. He shrugs. Nah, I was a man by then. Grandma died all on my own, so I had to grow up fast, you know. Come on, girl. I ain't insecure. Just tell me I'm great. 14 years old. That's Shay's age, a voice inside shouts. Poor Corey. He doesn't even realize he was taken advantage of or how much hurt or how much he's been hurt. Maybe that's why he said he has such a dark side. Judging my silence, Corey quickly adds, but I mean, I ain't grow up like you, bright eyes. We all got something. I shift closer, pay more attention to his game, loving him a little harder. And if I love him hard enough, maybe, just maybe, I can keep the dark side away. Um, and so even in this particular chapter, you know, we're talking about the adultification of black girls, but it's also just for black children in general, uh, where, you know, I feel as though the author was trying to bring to light that it's not just black girls that endure that either. It's also black boys, um, because as you can see, uh, the perpetrator in the book that is manipulating our main character, Enchanted, he also was taken advantage of at a young age as well. Um, and in his mind, again, it was normalized because we normalize, you know, what it means to uh, be a man per se and how that is often projected onto young black boys through their sexual experiences. Um, and so that particular chapter was really deep for me when I first read it, when I read this book. Um, but I love how the author really brought that to light. Um, and I love the way she uh, has created uh, this story. Um, so after that, we move on to a welfare check um, in chapter 50. And I will read it for you. <laughs> Enchanted, would you come here, please? The word please is a stranger in this house. So when I hear Corey say it, I bolt out of my room and freeze on the first staircase landing. At the front door is Tony, another bodyguard, Richie, Corey, and two police officers. I scurry down to join them. The officers, a white man and a black woman, never cross the threshold. But their presence is loud, fills up the entire house. Yes, I say, twisting a strand of Melissa around my pinky. Are you Enchanted Jones, the woman asks. Um, yes, we need to talk to you in private. I look at Corey, unsure if I'm allowed to speak. He gives a small nod. About what, I ask, my voice shaky. Corey steps in, his voice light and pleasant. As you can see, she's not chained up in the basement. She has free range to walk around the house as she pleases. Something about his demeanor makes me think he's done this before. Psh, you think a brother like Corey feels need to lock a bitch up to keep him? The bodyguard quips. Bitches be lining down the block just to get a taste. The woman gives him a once over. May we use your living room? Corey slaps on a sweet smile. Yes, ma'am, of course. By the way, she's 17. Age of consent in Atlanta, I believe. She raises an eyebrow. Yes, thank you for pointing out you know the laws in Georgia so well. A tense silence falls. Bugs fluttering through the open door. Corey shoves his hand into his sweatpants. The white officer reads the room, then proceeds. We'll be right in there. Fine, do what you gotta do. Richie pulls Corey aside, whispering in his ear, keeping him calm. Corey's jaw stiffens, never taking his eyes off of me as the officer leads me into the living room. Even as the woman closes the double doors in his face. Hello, Enchanted, the white officer says. We received a call to check on your well-being. My teeth chatter loud enough to hear down the block. I rub my arms. By who? We're not at liberty to say, but per protocol, we need to ask you a few questions. Enchanted, are you being held against your will? The woman asks bluntly. A shiver zips down my back. We had practiced every scenario we could ever think of, but this is new and frightening. Lying to fans and strangers is one thing, but lying to the police is another. 
My mind races thinking of the settlement with Candy, the way he broke down on the balcony in Miami, and the promise I made. No, are you in need of assistance? The double door cracks open just slightly. Someone else would confuse it for a gust of wind, but I knew, but I know better. No, I'm fine, I say with a stiff smile. Out in the hall, I hear Corey clear his throat. Everything's fine here, I say stronger, louder. We're recording my album. Something slaps against the wall. The officers exchange a glance, but carry on. The, the woman officer says, so you want to be here. Yes, yes, I want to be here. I almost believe the words coming out of my mouth. The woman gives me another once over, eyeballing my oversized sweatshirt. They ask me a few more questions, but quickly realize my answers are going to remain the same. Back in the foyer, Corey and Richie are waiting. All done, Corey says. Yes, the woman says. Corey smirks. Well, thanks for stopping by. The woman nods at me, just me, and walks back to the patrol car. The man waits until she's a few feet away before turning with a grin. Sorry about all this, but uh, hey, can I get your autograph? My wife says she's a huge fan, and she'd kill me if she knew I met you and didn't at least try. Corey thickens his charm. Sure, man. Sorry y'all came all the way for nothing. You know, trolls stay trolling. As he signs the officer's flip book, offering to pose for a selfie, I creep away slow, willing myself invisible. Maybe this will all blow over. Maybe it won't be that bad. But no more than two feet into my room, the front door slams, my lungs strength as his feet stomp up the stairs. He charges in, face emotionless. You know, it was them nosy-ass parents of yours who sent them cops, right? You talked to them? Yeah, they said they were going to do this shit, he snapped, shaking his head. His head. They text me. Can I see? He cocks his head to the side, stepping toward me. Why you need to see? What, you don't trust me? Panic surges and my arms go limp. No, no, no. Of course I trust you. I I just wanted to see what they said. That's all. He cuts his eyes before flopping onto the bed. They said they wanted more money. Said I ain't paid them enough for you. I think I've given them plenty. Shit, I'm overpaying after all the shit you've put me through. Can, can I have my phone back, please? That's all you got to say to me, he roars. No, I mean, I can call them and try to... After everything I've done for you, all you want is your phone back. You should be on your knees begging me to keep you. Get on your knees now. I hesitate before kneeling. Corey approaches and I have to crane my neck back to look up at him. He steps closer, crotch in my face, and my stomach drops. Please, Corey, I whimper. I don't want to fight. I love you. Corey blinks as if the word love broke him out of a trance. He mumbles a curse and brushes by, storming out of the room. When the studio door slams below, I exhale the breath I've been holding, hands trembling. If only he'd give me back my phone, then maybe I could convince my parents to back off just for a little while. They're making things harder for us, for me really, but if they give us some space, maybe he'll return to normal. Uh, let's see. So that particular chapter just shows you even... Um, those that are supposed to protect those of us that are in danger. You saw the police officer asked the artist for his autograph. Um, they didn't really pry as much as they should have um, with doing the wellness check. And so then the young lady is still left to uh, fend for herself against uh, her predator. Um. A really impactful chapter for me also in this book was, it's called Pictures Worth a Thousand Words, and uh, it's chapter 75. And so it's pretty much like uh, a dialogue of um, all of the social media frenzy that's going on around uh, this particular situation because there is uh, a sex tape that comes out and then um, it just kind of erupts into a social media frenzy. So I will read that chapter and then I will read the picture worth a thousand words chapter. Uh, so chapter 65, sex tape. On the news, Corey's publicist gives a statement in front of his condo building. My client is extremely upset that someone would steal his personal and private property. However, we are confident that the individuals, whoever they may be, will be found and face severe consequences. 
Shay stays home from school to avoid the onslaught. Don't know why, because it's not me. Louis tells us to stay quiet and keep our heads down. Let the media circus blow over. He thinks it's me, but it's not me. Mom is on the phone talking to a lawyer. Don't know why, because it's not me. Daddy seen clips and now he ain't even looking at me. He thinks it's me too, but it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. I say it over and over to myself until it becomes a hum in my ear. I feel like fall. I am a heap of dead leaves, blackened, moist, reeking of mold, rotting apples, dying grass, early darkness, chasing away the sun. Someone printed a screenshot of the video and taped it to my locker. Even the janitors give me questioning glares. Mr. Walker turned red when I walked into AP, AP English. He's seen the video. English used to be my favorite. Wrote some of my best lyrics in here. Now I can't think of a single word to write, except it's not me. I scribble it over and over in my songbook. It's not me. It's not me. It's not me. Chasing this dream has turned into a nightmare. Out the window, past the grassy knoll, wind hits the flags flying high on white poles. Mr. Walker's classroom is on the north side of campus. Near the student parking lot, I strain to search for Gab's car among the BMWs and Audis. Rich kid cars, Gab joked. She was proud of her Toyota Corolla. I cringe at the idea of Gab watching the video, maybe with Jay in his campus dorm room with the rest of school. I asked a few people in class about Gab, but no one seemed to know who I was talking about. She was the only senior in our biology class. How could they not notice her? At the very back of the lot, sunlight glints off the tinted window of a familiar black Mercedes parked near the exit. It's close enough for me to notice, but far enough that no one would take a second glance. The jet black opulence is unmistakable. Corey. I can't see through his tents, but I know it's him sitting there with his engine purring, watching and waiting. Waiting to take me, waiting to trap me, waiting to kill me. Run. A, sh a shutter shoots through me and I'm on my feet. Mr. Walker says something to my back as I sprint out into the hall. I keep running. Though my legs ache and my body is full of dead things, I run. Straight down into the gym locker room. What am I going to do? Am I ever going to get rid of him? And what if this really... What if this is really my fault? Like Shay said, I sent him that Aretha Franklin song. I follow him on social media. I called him in Jersey. I wore that sexy top to the studio. I kissed him. Chant, a scream escapes and I cover my mouth with both hands, voice echoing in the empty locker room. Shay stands by the sinks, taking in unsteady step back. What are you doing down here? I saw you running past my class. Was she followed? Did she shut the door? He's here, I whisper. Corey, outside in his car. Shay frowns, you saw him, are you sure? I nod, trembling. I have to tell someone just in case I don't make it out alive. He's coming for me. Her eyes grow big. It chanted, you're scaring me. She says it really harsh like she doesn't believe me. He was at teen conference too. I saw him before the dance. What? Why didn't you tell mom? I, I thought I could handle him. I thought I could keep him in check. How do you think you were going to handle someone like him? He's Corey Fields, a superstar. You're just, you... We need to tell mom. She's right. Corey has all the money, all the power. I'm just me. Um, yeah, so this, I forgot to even mention that uh, as the story goes on, the you know, after the wellness check, the family then gets the uh, young girl back. They get enchanted back. And then she spends a lot of her time um, after that pretty much uh, gaslighting herself because of the experience that she had with Corey. Um, and then he's also still showing up in different places. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, he's the one causing harm and she feels as though, you know, she feels unprotected and everybody is protecting um, Corey and he is the one, he's the perpetrator. Um, so this chapter is called Pictures worth a thousand words. There are so many pictures of Corey when he was younger. Every news outlet shows them on repeat. Did you know Corey Fields couldn't read, read a single sheet's worth of music? He could just about play any instrument you put in front of him using his ear like a blind man. I scroll through the various feed. 
Mom said to stay away from the, from the news, but I couldn't help it. Seeing young Corey makes me long for the Corey I thought I knew. The big kid trapped in a man's body. I scroll to another picture of Corey standing next to Richie. Back then, he barely reached Richie's chest, hair in slick cornrows, dressed in baggy clothes. The caption reads, Grammy after party, love you forever, KF. That was the party he told me about <clears throat> where he lost his virginity. I flip to the next photo and my jaw hits the floor at the woman standing next to him. His skinny arm wrapped around her tiny waist, his head just at her breast. Her hair is different. Blonde finger waves. Her face is different too, but I recognize her. Jessica. To anyone else, the photo would seem innocent, but something about the way she leans into his arms, his childlike arms, makes my stomach clench. I click on another link and it brings me to a Facebook post with almost 300 comments. If you mourning him, you're mourning a pedophile. Pedophile, she was a grown ass woman. Bruh, grown ain't 17. She didn't look 17, shrugs. But once you find out she's 17, you still gonna smash? So we just gonna jump and believe this girl? He's abused other women too. That wasn't proven, just a bunch of settlements. Children lie when they get caught doing something they're not supposed to. That's what they do. A group of children who don't know each other can't all be lying. That's called a pattern. That should be enough proof. You know there are three sides to every story. Her side, his side, and the truth. There's also fact. In fact is no man should be sleeping with a 17-year-old girl, period. You see her body rocking around in them tight dresses? She was just tempting him, another fast-ass girl. Why are we blaming and shaming little black girls, women, for being fast when they're simply being themselves for just being? What a woman wears or doesn't wear doesn't give anyone the right to touch them. Well, you know he's had a rough childhood, abandoned by his mom, didn't know his father, raised by his grandma who passed. We've all been through a lot, but that don't give you no excuse to abuse girls. You know how these groupies do. They was looking for a come up and didn't get what they wanted. Now they're coming for the brother's neck. They were about the dollar dollar bill. Money doesn't give anyone permission to treat them like an animal. You know that girl's probably from a broken home. Ain't got no real man in her life to set an example. Did you pull a muscle with that reach? She was in Will and Willow and her parents are married. Just cause a girl from a broken home don't mean you get to piss on her. What the fuck is wrong with y'all? So why are we not just as angry at the parents who gave permission and took his money is my only question. Isn't it their job to pro first pro to protect their daughter? I'm just saying, charge them too. They the pimps. Why is everyone so busy trying to find anyone to blame instead of the person actually responsible for committing a crime? Everyone that worked for him knew those girls were too young and yet they let him. If that was my daughter, he'd be six feet under. Where was all this outrage when the pre-story came out or Weinstein? Wake the fuck up, people. We'd rather talk shit about our own people while you got a white man in the White House that, that is clearly fucked up in the mind. I can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, bro. Still, how many black men are in prison because of something some chick said? Don't care. Black, white, orange, haired. Lock them up. Yo, don't all lives matter? We ain't saying the other shit ain't wrong either, but we talking about black women right now. That's it. Focus. If these were white girls, Corey would be cremated and thrown in the sewer. I met my husband at 16 and he was 20. I don't see the problem with dating an older man. Yeah, but your husband didn't abuse you, didn't lock you in your room with nothing but a bucket. Y'all talking about some imaginary sex dungeon that no one has ever seen. So the girls word are not enough. Why don't people ever believe women? Why didn't she just leave? She was being brainwashed, brainwashed. That's bullshit. You never heard of a cult where you burn, burn, blah, born yesterday. <laughs> Fake news. Yo, Malcolm X said it best. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. Uh, that chapter really resonated with me uh, because it's just interesting that we do blame uh, survivors of abuse instead of the person that abused them. And 
instead of people thinking, oh, this is a child, she's 17, surely this man manipulated her and he, you know, put her in these situations that were harmful to her. But it's like we hold on and we idolize those that are in power, specifically when we're talking about um, celebrities, um, but no one sees the issue. It's like we absolve people from the wrong and the harm that they do towards others um, based off of what they have accumulated. So because he was this, you know, renowned star, it's like, oh, surely uh, she did something to make him do this to her. Um, surely she was a gold digger. And then also the part that also really uh, bothered me, which is, again, something that was found in this study that people tried to blame um, how people, their background and how they grow up for how they end up maybe in uh, not so great situations. And that's not fair because children deserve protection. Uh, black, Even further, black girls deserve protection. Um, I don't care what the situation is. And so that's why I really appreciated um, the author's note about what this story was about um, and making you think about how maybe, you know, you might try to absolve yourself from certain things that you have seen um, in the media and how black girls are just never really given the autonomy to one, just exist and be innocent and enjoy childhood. It's always... Oh, well, she knew better. You know, when you're growing up, you're a kid. You don't necessarily always know better. You know what I'm saying? So it's always the responsibility of the adults in the children's lives to ensure um, their safety. Um, and so I have about two more chapters. Yeah. And then that'll be it. And don't forget to like uh, the post comment to for your chance to win a copy of the book uh this is chapter 82 um this is called a visit as birds chirp to the rising sun i hear the unmistakable sounds of an old clanking engine puttering to a stop in the driveway the squeaky storm door slams then mom's snappy voice interrupts the peace of the morning what are you doing here and at this time of day I still get the news a woman answers back and my chest tightens. Silence falls between them. All right, come on then, mom yells. Let's hear it. Hear what, the woman says, amused. The I told you so speech. Go on. That's what you came here for, right? Don't need to tell you something you already know. Her words cut deep. They always have. Now, can I see my granddaughter or are you going to keep me out here all day? We have to bring her in tomorrow, mom sniffles through tears. Then let me have today. Context. I forgot to mention that the story begins with, uh, like I said, uh, Enchanted waking up in blood um, because she wakes up and Corey is dead. So we're at the point in the story where she's the family is having to turn her in to the police. Um, in the distance, green water spirals into waves, barreling toward me. I thread for a moment, then kick hard in their direction before they're too treacherous and split them sideways. The waves foam white as they hit the sandy shore. Nearby, Grandma pops up from under the water. Ooh, water nippy today. Skin can't seem to get warm. From some angles, Grandma looks like Ursula from The Little Mermaid. A shock of short... Snow white hair, skin, a tint of purple, a round tummy, and a boisterous laugh. Her tentacles everywhere at once, enough to wrangle me and the littles. We're buoyed in silence as another wave forms in the distance. I swim toward it, grandma on my tail. Even at her old age, grandma is an excellent swimmer. Taught me everything I know, but the unpredictable ocean is propensity for violence. Those lessons were lost on land. There are only a few dedicated swimmers and surfers out here in early June. The water still has a bit of winter's chill, not the warm bath conditions we have in the summers. The water sinks its icy teeth into us, but feels just fine to me. So how long are we gonna float out here? Get in late. Think we should head in, maybe pick up some Popeyes on the way home, crispy shrimp. The salt water burns the back of my throat. Nearby, a plastic bag floats and I think of the jellyfish. I can almost feel the remnants of his steam the force of his hit, the rage in his eyes, the ice bucket. I turn, waiting for the next wave. She chuckles, I guess not, just a little longer. 
I finally say, don't know when I'll be able to do this again. There's a rancid smell in grandma's apartment that makes it impossible to eat. As she fixes us hot cocoa in the kitchen, I search for the culprit, digging through boxes of old newspapers, bags of empty plastic bottles, and crates of records piled to the ceiling, blocking the sunset. Behind another set of boxes in the corner is an empty fish tank. I peer at the horror inside. Um, Grandma, I think the turtle is dead. She scoffs. No, it's not, honey. He's being silly. Come on now before your cocoa gets cold. I draw in a breath, recovering the tank and cracking the window to air out the suffocating stench. We sit in the dark living room watching her old box TV with the funny clicker remote. Daddy set up her Amazon Fire Stick to watch, but she's committed to basic channels. Her home has either shrunk or I've grown. I always considered this place a castle, but now I see it for what it really is. The clutter, the random articles from the beach she found with her metal detector, forks, spoons, half-broken jewelry. She was fascinated by humans' trash, just like Ariel. It was the perfect house for the hoarder show Shay likes to watch. How did we all fit in here before, Grandma? Yes, honey. What happened when you found out you were sick? She laughs. I'm not sick, baby. That's the problem. I see things clear as day. It's everyone else that don't see what's right in front of them. People see what they want to see all the time. I nod, cooling my cup. Grandma glances at the chair next to me. Oh, no. She wouldn't want to do that. I look at the empty chair, then back to her. Do what? Grandma giggles, waving me off. Oh, nothing. You know, they just love your voice. That's all. They want you to sing. The empty chair says nothing. Um, sure, Grandma. Why not? Grandma nods at the chair. Ain't my grandbaby something? Y'all say thank you. Not every day we get a real star in here. The crates of old vinyls are covered in two years worth of dust. Okay, you want some Whitney or Aretha? No, we need a classic. We just came from the sea. They want that. Little Mermaid? Yes, that's the one. Okay, Grandma, I laugh. I sing Part of Your World, which is always fun, singing a cappella. Something I hadn't done in a while. My voice is raw, unhinged even. Something about being back here, performing in this place, I found my voice feels different. Grandma sways as she listens glancing over at the empty seat, nodding in agreement, then claps when I'm done. You know why I like that movie? Because you like my singing and know I like to swim? Ha, well that too, but no, I liked it because the princess saved herself. No, she didn't. Eric saved her, the prince, and her dad, the king. No, 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 she laughs, the light from the TV bouncing off her dark skin. She saved herself from the sea long before that silly prince came flopping along. She took hold of her life, didn't care what anyone else had to think or say. Even if they thought she was crazy, she did what she wanted, and folks just had to deal. Like when you cut off all your hair. You didn't care. You just did it. Some brave guts you've always had. Get that from my side of the family. Grandma sips her cocoa, allowing the chocolate milk mustache to sit on her top lip. I glance around the room again, refocusing my lens to what this place used to be. A treasure trove of the most wondrous things. Grandma, I'm in trouble. She nods. Yes, baby, you are. And I don't know what to do. Well, what would Ariel do? Maybe one, maybe run away from home, I chuckle. Trade her voice for some legs. Grandma shrugs and flips a few channels, humming, landing on E! News. There's Richie talking about the upcoming Corey documentary. No watch on his wrist. Jessica must have told him. I doubt she'd take it, knowing how... It could implicate her. She's smarter than Richie. She must have told him to get rid of it. But he wouldn't throw it away, and he couldn't be no, dumb enough to pawn it. So he must still have it somewhere. Grandma, I have to go. Where to? I smirk, zipping up my hoodie to save myself. Grandma smiles. Okay, baby, have fun. Okay. Okay, so... Give me one second. Okay. So. Chapter 89 is called Princesses Must Save Themselves. Flounder recorded 75 minutes of footage. Positioned toward the bed, there was a crystal clear view of Corey punching me in the face. Then Richie opening the penthouse door from the studio, using the key fob Jessica gave him. 
His battery died right as Richie shoved the knife into Corey's chest. Richie was arrested. So was a 35-year-old Jessica. With all the bad press and Corey's obsession with the spiraling, a scorned Jessica saw the perfect opportunity to kill the man who broke his promise of stardom, pinning it on the girl who took her place. The murder would also guarantee Richie's documentary would be an instant hit. They plan to live happily ever after in the Hollywood Hills, managing Corey's estate. But once caught, Jessica sang like a humpback. Love is complicated. Will and Willow collected names and stories from seven girls nationally who claimed they'd been with Corey Fields. With most of the black parents being wealthy and well-connected, it added fuel to the fire of a growing case. A box of Corey Fields' digital memory cards were recovered in the home he shared with his wife. There were dozens of them, dozens of girls he recorded over his entire career, not nearly the number, number who have come forward. Okay, and then this is the last chapter which I think is important to read. It says, chapter 90, the truth. <clears throat> Even though it's summer, I feel like spring. I feel like a plant being brought back to life, blooming and growing. The smell of sweet flowers, fresh earth, and new beginnings mixed with lemon, icy, and the fierce love of a mother and father. More women come forward. KA moves to ban Corey Fields' music across all platforms. Radios refuse to play him, and debates carry on over social media, or so I've heard. Mr. Pooley didn't have to fight too hard to cancel my contract with the label. They quietly let it go, sending along a sizable check to cover any inconveniences. It helps to keep Shay in school and in Will and Willow. I won't be going back. I plan to pursue music full time since I'm free, full, and whole. Bloop, another girl came forward, Gabriella says, knows in her phone, second girl this week. Gabriella and I share a veggie plate on my porch as the littles play in the front yard. Last time I'll see her for the next few weeks, planning to spend the summer with grandma and far Rockaway to find my voice and return to the sea where I belong before Louis releases my EP in the fall. Good. Maybe someone will come forward soon so everyone can stop thinking it was me in the stupid video. Gab yeah, puts down her phone. Girl, what? She gives me a sharp glare. Why are you still lying? You know it was you. We hold a stare. Gab emboldened and I resolved because if I keep denying the memory, it'll make it untrue. Works for grandma. It's, it's not me, I say matter of factly and gaze into my cup of beet juice. I remember the blood. I remember waking up to the sound of Corey screaming, the heavy footsteps as a man ran by my head. I remember peering up from the floor, the room hazy, the taste of purple drink still on my tongue, seeing Corey on the bed bleeding everywhere. I remember him stretching and reaching for the knife lying between us. I remember the fear, painted in memories, ripping through me, knowing if he hadn't reached that knife, he'd kill me. I remember, remember wobbling to my feet, grabbing the knife and plunging it into his chest. I remember collapsing on the floor, covered in beet juice, and for the first time, I met him feeling truly safe before the world went black. Shanti, look at me, Destiny says, calling me back as she attempts a cartwheel. Good job, I cheer and take a sip of beet juice. Stuff is better than I thought. So that is it. Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson. Um, I also encourage you to read some of her other books, Allegedly and Monday's Not Coming. Remember to like the post so we can enter you into the drawing. And thank you for coming to the reading.